is going on YouTube? What is going on Kansas City? And what is going on everybody? And welcome to the beat of KC. Today, ladies and gentlemen, Joshua Briscoe. Ladies and gentlemen, I, this is a privilege. This is amazing. He's going to be <laughs> batting lead off. He's going to be batting lead off. He is the editor in chief and publisher at Arrowhead Report on SI.com. Covers everything Kansas City. Also does the post game show on 810 WHB, but he also also host almost entirely sports josh oa briscoe what is going on my friend thank you for having me lucas i think thank you for getting i mean at least the majority of the things that i do uh i've i've got the privilege of you know doing a handful of podcast interviews here and there genuinely enjoy it almost always a good time uh but every time i kind of am doing the thing in my head of like which one are they going to lead like just leave off the list because there are simply too many things to get right you got a good chunk of them though yeah, I know these, you still do, you do some stuff with uh, you got you got another one as well. You do another podcast, and then that's uh, right. That's the I think the only thing you really missed there was Time Zars on the Athletic. Yeah, with on the, athletic, the illustrious yeah. Nate Taylor and Seth Kaiser. But yeah, man, now I'm going to add the beat KC to my to my resume, and I'm happy to talk to you. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. I'm super pumped. Uh, the first question I want to lead off with is: Can you let everybody know where they can find you God, uh, as far question. as your your handles and things like that? My favorite question anyone's ever asked me, the best question possible is how can people find you? I love that stuff. Uh, I'm at JB Briscoe on every social media platform that I'm on, I think. Um, but especially on Twitter, that, that's sort of the launch pad. It's where you can see, you know, I've got a pinned tweet with all the things that I'm involved with on some major level. So you can, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at JB Briscoe and then everywhere else. We've got some Facebook pages. We've got, I, I try to Twitch stream every once in a while. But it's really, it's almost entirely sports weeknights on 810. It's Chiefs post game on 810 during the season. It's Time Zars. It's ArrowheadReport.com. And uh, it's, it's JB Briscoe anywhere you want. There it is. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. And honestly, that pin tweet helped me out so much. <laughs> it, it was incredible for sure. So you just pan down there. It all is. It's uh, magic. So, so this really, this first question I'm going to ask you, I think is going to be the most toughest out of this entire podcast. Awesome. And I, I really do think you might have to think about it. Okay. If you have to pick, that go-to song that's going to get you just hyped up to the next level. You need it. What song are you going with? I'm picking up my phone right now. Cause you're right, man. I'm going to my Spotify. So uh, a hype song, like I'm putting, I'm putting one song on a playlist. Like this is going to get you there one song and you got to go with it because it's like, it's going to take you to the next level. God, it's such a tough question. Elite. You're, you are so right. Um, I here here are the three the three uh, albums and artists I've been listening to the most, most recently, I'm going to, I'm going to have to think it out loud, pare it down. The new Tyler, the creator album, call me if you get lost. Great. And so you can pull a, a good number of songs from that. That would fit the bill. Um, I, this is the whitest answer possible. I think, and the most on brand millennial who I am answer. I was listening to hot fuss again, the killers album that has Mr. Brightside as along with a whole bunch of other certified club bangers, that album, unbelievable. And I have been really into Glass Animals for the last like six months to a year, okay. maybe. Okay. Um, but not, that's not super like hype, though. Um, and I, I have an entire playlist that is basically just to, to have a chance to answer that question for you. Um, well, let me ask you this. Do you listen to anything like do you have to get hyped up before you go on the radio like do you or are you just like, hey, I've been in the group for so long that I'm just I just tune in and I just get rolling. Sometimes um, a lot of the uh, uh, start a riot by Duckworth from the uh, uh, end of the spider verse soundtrack might be an answer and uh, district by Brockhampton. Those are on the, those are on the, the um, bad vibes playlist that I have. There it, it is. So occasionally I'll open that up and it, it really depends on the type of show, right? Cause sometimes it's just, everything is hectic and we're diving in whenever, you know, the program is on their way out. And those days there's no, we're just moving. It's just all yeah. high speed. Sometimes, you know, we'll get in and this is going to, blow some minds this is some inside information sometimes radio interviews are recorded earlier in the day <laughs> and i don't want to you know i don't want to give the whole industry away but sometimes you know we'll get in and we'll tape it have to tape an interview at, at two and then the show doesn't start until like eight o'clock there's a lot of time for you to kind of sink in even if you're staying yeah. relatively busy um you want to have a good energy level because if i if we start the show and i sound bored Rudy's going to get bored. Beard's is going to get bored. The listener's going to get bored. So, uh, you know, there's a difference between having like a good subdued energy and then, and just having energy period. Mm -hmm. But yeah, sometimes, sometimes you got to dip into the bag a little bit. Sometimes you got to say, 
uh, it's, it's Brockhampton time. Yeah. I hear you, man. I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a go-to Drake guy. Uh, I've got, and- I've got, so I think, I think maybe the song that birthed the bad vibes playlist here is I'm upset by Drake because yes. it is a song about being upset, disrespected yes. financially with not enough money on your head. That is, <laughs> that's basically the starting point. I, it's kind of, it can be kind of corny. Drake can be kind of corny. Yeah. I hear He's you. Also I excellent. hear you. But exactly. see, that's what I'm talking about. That I wanted to start off this episode absolutely on fire. I feel like we've got that. And that leads I me into too. the Kansas City Chiefs. That's a big reason why I wanted to have you on here. Um, I got a juicy question that I'm really excited to ask you, but I'm going to save it just for a little bit. Oh, man. Uh, okay. tell so, me, tell, warn me when we're going to get juicy. Tell me oh, when yeah. the, the juicy one's coming. When it, oh, yeah, for sure. So um, <clears throat> we're getting ready to go into one of the most important parts of the NFL season, and that's clearly the, the training camp. You know, there's a lot of things that go on in training camp. What are you most excited for going into training camp overall from this entire team? Like what just the vibe? Is it the, is it the players? Like, what are you most anticipating and excited for? I think I'm in some ways I'm excited for the point when I stop being excited by preseason games. Cause there's always that moment, you know, halfway through the second one, certainly maybe you get, you know, until the starters leave in the third preseason game, you're like, all right, I'm ready to get this over with. But even that's different this year. Cause there are yeah. only three preseason games. And there's always a time there's a, there's sort of a, um, I don't think it's, it may, maybe it's a bell curve. Maybe it's just a slope of like, Oh yeah, it's training camp time. Oh, look at this. Are right, we having fun? Oh, okay. Preseason game. We're kind of a little roller coaster. It's exciting again. And then it always mellows out and we always get to a point where we go, God, I could just really go for some real football right now. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of just excited to go through that process again. Cause it was very weird last year, obviously no preseason games and training camp wasn't in St. Joe. So I, I'm excited for that. I'm excited to see, you know, some stuff with the receivers and the, the offensive line, but um, it also wouldn't hurt my feelings if the season started tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. I would probably need some more warning. If the season started next weekend, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be mad about it because um, that's the that's the really fun stuff. Because you there, there's no you know there, there's not a whole lot of withholding at that point. You know you're not saving anything for the real season or whatever. So, um, but I'm I'm also just kind of excited for all of it. Like I you know I I gave the Royals what I could, man. I really I really dug in on baseball yeah. as much as I could afford to. All star breaks when my season ends at this point. I'm ready for football. For sure, man. I, I most definitely, you know, I think uh I'm still I'm still very optimistic about the Royals. I'm um I, I don't think it's gonna be a super successful season, but I think you're gonna start to see some of the young, you know, talent come up here before long and maybe start getting plugged in. Hopefully Oliveris isn't too car sick and he can stay Jeez, for a little man. bit longer. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what happens with them. But you know, I, I think honestly the Kansas City Chiefs, I think they're gonna they're really gonna be going in to obviously training camp with the mentality of going 20 and 0 and I heard <laughs> I heard your interview uh with Travis Kelsey by the way that was one of the most tremendous interviews you know you thank and you. Curtis Siebel well it was tremendous it really was thank you but I like how after the fact you had to kind of address you know look like this is what I was trying to actually say <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe it wasn't one of the best interviews of all time if I if I fundamentally believe that Travis Kelsey absolutely misunderstood the framing of my question um <laughs> that that might have that might have been on me but yeah it's so like um you know if anyone didn't hear it you could hear it wherever just search for almost entirely sports wherever you get yes. podcast you can you can find it there on the podcast page yes. um but yeah on the 20 and 0 things I, I asked like the, the spirit of my question was it's silly that we have made a story out of them wanting to go 20 and 0. And that, that was, was the spirit be, yeah. of the question. Yeah. You know, that was going to be my question to you is, <laughs> is like, do you think that that's just a, like a dry period of NFL? And that's something that always get like, there's always something that's related to that. Not necessarily going 20, and 0, but something like that comes out where it becomes kind of a hot topic and it really shouldn't be a hot topic. Is that just a, a dry period in the reporting aspect? Is that what it truly honestly is? I think it's a huge part of it. If it's not all of it, I think it's a huge part of it is that we want to put football on first take. We're going to write stories because we want people to click the website. You know, that's, that's the machine. It's the content machine everywhere. And every content machine sells ads during commercial breaks or on the sides of the website, you know, Um, that's sort of the, I don't want to say it's the dirty side because it's not, it's not, it's not fabricated, but it's a silly thing to hyper-focus on. But if you have nothing else to focus on, you know, how many times can, can I write about the chief's right guard spot? 
Yeah. Not that many more. <laughs> like yep. without something yep. new happening, I got nothing new. I, I what do you want me to I'm gonna say the same exact thing about so I you know that that happens. What I think we can do, we being the media as a whole in a way that's maybe a little more thoughtful, is that we can talk about it in the way that I'm trying to talk about it, you know, of like, yeah, he said this. It, Patrick Mahomes, and in case anyone doesn't have the full like ramp up of this, Patrick Mahomes at another golf event was asked what his goals for this season were. He says, you know, I don't really have any individual goals. I just want us to go win every game and I want to win the Super Bowl again. All right, great. If he would have said, I want to throw for 50 touchdowns and 5,000 yards, the first take bottom graphic the next day would have, would have been, you know, Patrick Mahomes, all of Patrick, me, Holmes, like star quarterback looking for selfish stats in 2021. And instead yeah. he said, Hey, I want the whole team to win. And yeah. so what Kelsey told us was, you know, I asked if it was silly that it's been a story and he, I, he took it as, is it silly to shoot for 20 and oh, and you know, it is what it is. I didn't yeah. ask the question as, as perfectly as I would have liked. He gave a great answer anyway. It, it is what it is. I do but like that you asked that. Yeah, I like that you asked that question because I agree with you 100%. I think that it is silly that this is even being talked about because, of course, how he answered is their mentality. Girls are going into it thinking that they're going to go 20 and 0. I mean, every team in the NFL has that mindset, even if they're the worst team in the NFL. I mean, that is just, I, yeah, I agree with you. And I, I get why you asked the question again. I just think that. He just was, he kind of was amped up too, probably a little bit. And also it was at the American century and he's, he drinks like 50 beers a day at the, at the American century. And God bless him. Not a criticism. In fact, that's me saying that from a place of admiration. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I, regardless, he, he answered the question that I wasn't asking really well, which also was basically answering the question that I did ask. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm, I appreciate you saying that about the, the interview as a whole. It, it was, it was a, a, a very, uh, good opportunity to talk to him one on one, and also for me, man, this is also very. I don't know how inside media you want to spend to our conversation, but yeah. like the difference between even just having a dude on the phone for for ten minutes, and you know not being able to see him, and we don't have like a relationship, but um, and the difference between that even, much less you know a thirty minute sit down at a at a, a table or whatever, versus the press conferences over Zoom. Everybody it just acts so differently all the time. Um, and it's it's kind of funny to see how much that's changed things over the course of the last really, I mean, you know, year and a half, especially. Yeah, for sure. Do you still get hyped up for those types of interviews? Like, I mean, it's mm. Travis Kelsey. Like, I mean, that's that's a big person inside, you know, obviously the Kansas City Chiefs. He's gonna be, yeah. you know, everything. Like, do you still get amped up when you go to talk to those guys? I um I think the last time that I was like uh, you know a little a little bit legitimately nervous was talking to I was filling in on a on a show on 810 two two and a half three years ago or something and and Mahomes had his weekly interview with the show and so I I did a full you know 12 or 15 with with Mahomes um and it went pretty well and you know everybody was like hey talk to Mahomes great and I I think at least since then if not sooner I it's just kind of the, the job, right? Yeah. Um, there, there are probably a handful of people, but like that day, because of everything going out at Lake Tahoe over the course of like an hour. And also I was not supposed to talk to Travis Kelsey, by the way, there ended up being a whole bunch of wires that got crossed. He was supposed to go on with Petro, but Petro was talking to Melvin Booker, who I would have loved <laughs> to talk to, you know, former Mizzou great Devin Booker's dad. Um, but they, they just started talking to Melvin Booker and Kelsey called in. And so Curtis came in a different studio and, and we did that there. It, that, that happened so fast that there was not really a, a chance to think about it too hard. Uh -huh. Um, and you know, there might be a handful of people if I was like really, you know, um, trying to make a good impression or something, if that was the front of my head, but in terms of just people we talked to like, so over the course of that day and over the course of a couple hours, I talked to, to Kelsey, Steve Young and Brett Saberhagen over the wow. course of like an hour. Yeah. And, um, it was just like, it was good. I was happy to do it. They, they were good to talk to for the most part. Uh, Kelsey was great and, and Sabre was really good. Steve Young didn't really want to talk to me, but you know, he gave me seven <laughs> minutes. That's um, awesome. but I think at, at some point, man, you just kind of, it's just kind of part of the job and it's just sort of, you know, you have to almost believe that it's peer to peer. Otherwise you're probably going to do a bad job. Right. So, yeah. um, a super interesting question though. And yeah. And, I'm thinking I'm going to keep thinking about it. If there's a, a time that I've been like, we did radio, I've been radio row and um, we were out at Lake Tahoe and stuff. There's, there's times where you're, it's hectic and, yeah. and you're kind of, you know, you want, you just want to do a good job, yeah. but in terms of like, oh bleep, that's, you know, 
I think I've talked to Clark Hunt directly a couple times, you know, and it's just, you want to do a good job that, that there's pressure, but I don't know if there is like, uh, you know, starstruck sort yeah. of things anymore for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I just figured over time, you know, you kind of just get settled in and they would just be like carrying on a conversation. So yeah, I always I was always curious about that. Um, but yeah, and also, I yeah, oh, sorry, here, I've oh, got go some more sage wisdom now, because I'm, I'm just to put it to put a cap on it, at least. Whenever you go, if you have a list of questions, and like, uh -huh. it seems like you have a you have some things you want to talk about. So this is not about like having bullet points, you want to have that. But if you're like, all right, here's my first question, second question, third question, fourth question, fifth question, you're going to get exact questions of those things, but maybe you miss on some good stuff, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't follow a rabbit trail that pops up or, um, you know, they, they want to kind of go off in a direction, but you kind of try to beat it back onto the path or whatever. The other thing when you go bop, 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 bop down the list is you, you are doing an interview and you, because you use the word conversation. I, if I can make the other person comfortable and it uh -huh. feels like a conversation, I'm going to enjoy it more. It's going to be a better interview. They're going to enjoy it more. It's a style that I, you know, want to bring to the table. I am, I do not really have a ton of interest in sitting down for a hostile interview, you know, like, you know, you know why did you order the code red? Like that is not, <laughs> I, I, if I had to, I'm sure I could, but it's not what I want to do for Travis Kelsey or Steve Young or Brett Saberhagen or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and sort of in kind of having that like warmer, more conversational environment, I think is a, a really important thing. So you're not just putting somebody on the stand, you know, yeah, um, for sure. which, which I think you're doing a good job of, by the way, clearly Thank because you. of how many rabbit trails you've let me go uh, yeah. fade off into. No, I, I really appreciate it because, you know, I'm, I'm new into this scene and I, I definitely am trying to figure out, you know, like ways to really kind of carry on a conversation or an interview and, and yeah. be professional, but also like, I want it to be super fun. And like the questions, you know, not always be the exact same, like you said, like who's going to be starting at right guard. And right. I also want it to pertain to sports and, and be very, you know, what you're about. So yeah. um, I, I always like to ask those questions for sure. Um, but that does lead me to uh, no. that I was going to joke about the right guard, but no, uh, uh, we can talk about the right. It's totally fun. It's just like the, we just can't talk about it for 40 straight minutes. No, you know, I, just, that's real, all. My real question. And, and the one that I was going to tell you is kind of juicy. Um, okay, I think juicy. this is definitely going to cover probably a, a decent amount of time. Cool. I actually wrote this down because I want to make sure that I worded it right. Usually I just ask the questions based on how the conversation or interview is going. Right. In this case, I, when the chief's front office comes together and decides they're wanting to sign a certain free agent or better yet make a trade, how much of that is determined based on leadership on the field versus play and performance on the field? And the reason I'm asking you this is I think you kind of had a, not necessarily a beef, but a definitely a very good conversation on Twitter the other night based on Frank Clark. And I really do want to get your thoughts because I think that this can go two different ways. And so I really want to hear what you you have to say about that. Yeah. So the, the leadership standpoint of things, I think it's an asset, like almost like anything else would be in terms of player evaluation. It's obviously <clears throat> a very unique one, but you know, I, I think Tyron Matthew is a great football player if he is quiet and not trying to move guys around. All the, if he is, a, if he sees himself as a as a pawn more th more so than as a queen or whatever, right? I, I think I think Tyron Matthew is still an excellent player, but I think he is made more valuable by the fact that he is a vocal leader who will take what Spags is saying in in one instance and keep that in the ear of the other guys, right? So I, I think that there can be additional value or. Um, I don't have an awesome example of this off the top of my head in, in football, and I'm sure it exists. You know, we could go Josh McCown here, okay? So, or, or Alex Smith, you know, if you, depending on what stage of his career he, he's in. You can have a player where you say, look, man, if, if Josh McCown has to actually play games for us this year, we're in pretty bad shape. But if he can be there for, again, not a great example, Sam Darnold, right? Mm -hmm. um, that there is real value to that more so than just taking a more physically gifted player who might not be the mentor to a young quarterback that you could have. So I think it's absolutely a part of the equation. Um, the, the space that we can spin off into or not, whatever, um, around the Frank Clark thing is trying to put a value on that. And, yes. and then also within the Chiefs locker room specifically, I think it's super interesting because to say, you know, 
well, the Chiefs on the leadership of Frank Clark in 2019, they don't end up in the Super Bowl without him. Kind of makes me go, well, so what now what does that say about Steve Spagnolo, about a very well respected group of coaches, about Tyron Matthew, about Anthony Hitchens, some of the other leaders they have on that defense, about Chris Jones? Like, was Frank Clark the guy holding it all together? Was he, you know, how impactful was he in getting everyone on board with Spags? Was that a necessary thing? And I don't know the answer to almost any of those questions that I just asked because I wasn't yeah. I wasn't there. Uh, but putting a value on it is something that I find really interesting. And there are lots of people th- who are excellent at their jobs, well respected, well connected throughout Chiefs media, where they aren't very interested in putting a value number on that. They just say, "Hey, he was there for this, and he played an important important role in this. Therefore, I don't want to ask any more questions about his value." And that's totally fine. Yeah. If, if somebody's not really interested in that conversation, I am completely okay with them tapping out. I would ask that if you're not interested in one of those conversations, you don't feel personally like you need to put a stop to it though. Cause some of the rest of us think that it's interesting. Yeah. Um, and you know, that there's always emotions in it and everything as well. So it's, it's really complicated. It's super, it's super multifaceted. Um, and it's, you know, it's difficult, obviously. For sure. You know, I think that is a very, a a very tough situation because, you know, how do you assess leadership on the field and how do you assess how well it translates into the performance of the team? I think when, when they made that trade, I don't think that they had any intention of him becoming this all world leader and like leading this defense. I mean, I think that there was some of that, you know, probably there, but that's just the player and who he comes with. I think they obviously went out to get him for his performance. Right. And, you know, I, I can see the two sides of the argument, but to, for people to say like the leadership is what won us the Super Bowl or even really got us to where we were, I think that's a little bit kind of a, a creative motive, I guess you could say. I just, I, I don't like think that. that. That's very generous. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really think that that is the full on reason why we, I mean, Patrick Mahomes is our quarterback. Let's just be that's real. Right. And, and what was actually led up to those events. I mean, I, that's just my thoughts, but I definitely wanted to ask you that question because I think you know, we didn't win the Super Bowl and we weren't, you know, going very, very deep into the playoffs when we had Eric Berry and Justin Houston. I mean, those two are outstanding leaders and and, and I would say played at pretty good levels on the defense, but didn't translate into taking us to the next level. So I I think it's very hard to value a a leadership um, category, I guess you could say. But yeah, I, I really, I'm glad we were able to talk about that. Um, now kind of to break it down a little bit to the X's and O's, um, let's say Frank Clark is suspended figuratively going into this season. Um, are you wanting to see the Kansas City Chiefs potentially address that defensive end spot? Or do you think that we have enough to go into the preseason and uh, potentially see some of those veteran cuts and maybe add somebody then? Or are you satisfied with where we're at with that DN spot? Before anything with Frank Clark, I wasn't really satisfied with the defensive end spot. Um, uh, Josh Kando, the the rookie, is kind of interesting. I would be really surprised if he played a tremendously large role in his rookie season. And then you've got Mike Dana, you've got Taco Charles, and a couple of guys that like have roles they could step into. I think Taco has a higher ceiling probably um, in terms of at least being a pass rusher. But what is that going to look like? I have no idea. Um, no Alex Okafor, obviously, you know, back to 2019, Emmanuel Agba played well and then got hurt and, and he's gone now. Um, so you have all these moving parts, but you'd start to see like, it's a very thin defensive end group. And so with or without Frank Clark, I, I think that's true. Obviously a huge part of all of that now ends up going to Chris Jones. Cause it sounds like it's, it's not just going to be that he kicks out there every once in a while. It, it really sounds like week one, like you're starting defensive ends barring suspension, I guess it'd be Chris Jones and Frank Clark. If Clark gets suspended, it's Chris Jones and taco Charlton. I'm, okay um all right i my internet didn't cut out anything i was just kind of loading in my brain i just yeah all right yeah um because you know talk was coming off an injury and he's still a pretty large unknown and and my, my hesitation with chris jones I, I i've always tried to be very clear about this because i love chris jones i think he's probably the second best interior pass rusher in football behind aaron donald so it makes him the best human being pass rush interior pass rusher in football because aaron donald is an alien with knives for hands yeah but you you take him and you kick him out to the edge i'm always a little bit um 
hesitant, I think, to just assume that a player can be elite at one spot and then be elite, you know, a couple yards to the side. I think he can be. And I think what they're really betting on is that, that, that Jaron Reed is, you know, a, a 30% drop off from Chris Jones, pretty arbitrarily, but say he's a 30% drop off from Chris Jones, but he can play that spot next to Derek Nadi. And then Chris Jones on the end is a 40% improvement on Taco Charlton. Okay, well, then at that point, does the math actually pan out there? It partially depends on the value of the position and all of that. Again, super rough numbers. But I, I just get a little bit of pause there because it seems like if they had more talent at defensive end, Chris Jones would stay at defensive tackle. Yeah. And that would not be the reason I would want to see them move is because they think, hey, I think this elite player can be elite and more impactful on the edge. Not, hey, I think we need someone on the edge and yeah. we can make Jaron Reed work in the middle. So the the defensive line across the board there gives me a, a little bit of pause. I think it'll be fine, but I, I also don't think it's probably going to be a, a dominant unit that gets pressure with four because they weren't that last year. And yeah. I think at this point, they're probably a little less talented than they were last year. Do you think that by them feeling a little bit more comfortable doing that, they're okay with their linebacking core to a certain degree? Because a big portion of what I feel that we were lacking, obviously, is that run at defense. And, you know, I think with adding a healthy Willie Gay, you go out, draft Nick Bolton. Now you're kind of cheering up a little bit of what you're expecting from that run. By then kicking Chris Jones out, like you said, you're kind of almost equaling leveling out that defensive front. Do you think that that's kind of a reason why as well, that they're a little bit more accepting of making that move now? I don't know. I mean, I, that I've never, I haven't thought about those two things being correlated. Obviously they have, you know, really invested back in, in their linebackers and they've, I mean, they've spent second round picks in back-to-back years. You would hope that the linebackers would be competent with that sort of investment. And, and, you know, I think Nick Bolton is probably a, not, not a red, I don't think he's going to red shirt in year one. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that's quite right, but I, I think that he will have a, a limited role at least to start mm-hmm. um, partially just based on how, it, how long it took for Willie Gay to get on the field. Yeah. Now, Nick Bolton played more collegiate snap, play more collegiate snaps and he, he played in the middle and, you know, he could command the defense. So maybe he'll have an easier time as opposed to Willie Gay having a, a very short career, collegiate career and, um, and, and just sort of having all the physical tools in the world, but maybe he wasn't quite ready for an NFL defense and maybe he will be with another off season and all that. But if those two things are, are comparable at all, um, I think Bolton's behind Hitchens in the depth chart for a while. Yeah. And you still are getting Ben Neiman who's out there in coverage. So I may, I would love to see Willie Gay take a, a larger step. I hesitate to, to predict it because uh, I'll, I'll continue to, I think, I think I'm plagiarizing this from myself. I've just said this phrase over a bunch of shows and podcasts lately, but I, I don't want to assume the ceiling for yeah. these guys um, because it very rarely happens. But if you don't assume the ceiling, you're a hater. And, if you don't, and you shouldn't assume the floor either. You shouldn't say, oh, Willie Gay is never going to play a meaningful snap of football. That's stupid. But I also think it's, pretty close to being equally ignorant to say Willie Gay is going to be Derek Johnson two yeah. this year. It's like, well, I don't, th- there's a chance that's the ceiling, but the, the most likely thing is that it's going to be somewhere, hopefully kind of in the upper half of, of mm-hmm. the best case and worst case scenarios. Yeah. I, you know, I, I like that. I think it's kind of like setting goals uh, from a fan perspective too. You're like, Hey, I'm hoping he can translate into this. Um, and then it's something to gauge it off of to kind of where he's at. And, um, you know, I think that's kind of one of the most unknown positions kind of is just because you are getting a full Willie Gay, hopefully healthy Willie Gay. You got Nick Bolton, you got Ben Neiman, hopefully kind of taking a little bit of a step in the right direction. And then Anthony Hitchens. So I'm excited for that. Um, but I do want to stick with the defensive side of the ball. A lot of people are concerned with, I've done a few videos and, really a lot of people are concerned with the cornerback position. I'm, I'm like maybe on the other side of the fence where I'm kind of like, I'm okay with where we're at right now. And I just want to see going into training camp, how that really plays out. I mean, they are going against Patrick Mahomes a lot in camp. So I think that is going to help them get a a little bit better, but what are your thoughts on the cornerback position? I think that is where I start when, if you were to say, Hey, pick something that you're worried about, I do think it would be corner for me. Um, And, and here's the thing is I'm not, I'm not, um, 
I'm, I, I don't feel like a soothsayer. It's not doom and gloom. I'm not telling you that the Chiefs are going to lose the division or even the conference because uh, because Justin Herbert's going to pick on the corners. So I, I don't I don't think that's any sort of foregone conclusion. I've I've been a bit of a Traverius Ward truther for a while now. I, mm-hmm. I like Traverius Ward, even though I took a little bit of a step back last year. Um, but I, I like him. I think he is a competent outside starting corner. Um, I really like Legarius Sneed. That second year for corners can be tough. Like you, yes. I think you will see steps back more often than you see steps forward. Oftentimes, um, after, at least just after, if not the second, going into the second year, just after having a good season, the, the Marcus Cooper year, you know, where he's a shutdown corner for four weeks, and then and then Peyton Manning basically just picks on him into <laughs> retirement. Um, so I'm always kind of nervous about that, even though I really like I really like Legarius Sneed. My favorite spot for Sneed, though, was that slot position that he ended up in post injury last year, where he and Spags basically found out kind of by accident that he can blitz. Yeah, and he's really good at it. He's yeah. great in the slot. And so let's let's say he's predominantly in the slot. Spags mentioned um, I cannot remember who it was, but somebody that he coached in Philly, I think it was that that had um, a, a, a guy would play on the outside and then kick in in sub packages. They spend like seventy five percent of the time with three corners on the field at this point. So you know whatever. Um, but maybe Sneed plays outside and then kicks in the slot for sub packages, and you've got Ward being your other guy. Okay, cool. Well, then your other outside guy who's out there seventy five percent of the time, it's <clears throat> it's probably Rashad Fenton. At this point, um, I like DeAndre Baker, but he broke his leg in week 17. He wasn't, I, I believe he wasn't wearing a helmet at any point through OTAs and mini camps yeah. and all of that. So what is his turnaround going to look like? I don't know. He's got, dude had a broken leg pretty recently. They trade for Mike Hughes from Minnesota. Um, that's fine. You, you have those guys. I think I'm probably glossing over somebody. I don't know. I can't, I feel like I, I run out of names eventually on the cornerback the spot. Um, but the thing for me that is f- so frustrating, and this came up on Twitter all the time as Bashad Breland was just sitting out mm-hmm. there and then he went and signed a very reasonable deal for a little more money than Mike Hughes is making in Kansas city with the Vikings. The chiefs basically gave up a draft pick to gain a little bit of cap space and to get a worse cornerback. Mm-hmm. They could have brought back Bashad Breland on a one-year deal. And I just simply would not be worried about any of this because yeah. you know, you can have Breland and Ward on your outsides for one more year and have Sneed spend his time in the slot. One of those guys gets hurt. One of those guys gets suspended, whatever. Rashad Fenton as your fourth, DeAndre Baker as your fifth. Mike Hughes is a lottery ticket. I guess I get Bo Pete Keys, maybe the other name. Like mm-hmm. you can just let those guys compete in training camp. And one of them's on the practice squad. And one of them is making the active roster, whatever. That is a unit that is deeper by a unit and also a unit of measurement and is, is more talented by a unit of measurement because you add Bashad Breland to the top of the stack and it knocks everybody else down a level. That just seemed like such a no brainer to me. It it seems so obvious of like, Hey, this is a way you can for a couple million dollars, a way you don't have to worry about this unit anymore. And the chiefs didn't take that path. And that, that one, that one does frustrate me still. Yeah. I completely understand that, you know, and, and then, Obviously, Kansas City, and I would say most fan bases, anytime someone becomes even a rumor or a hinkling that someone's going to be available, and then, you know, the Kansas City fan base is like, we want that player. Uh, I saw today as I was, you know, going down the rabbit hole of Twitter, Xavier Howard isn't happy down there in Miami. Um, is that someone that you would be interested in the Kansas City Chiefs pursuing because of the what we're dealing with at cornerback? You know, is that something that you would go do or would you rather add a Brian Poole maybe who is a seasoned veteran but is still available out there in the free agent market? If you had to take a route, which one are you going with? I, I was hoping to find something I had written on uh, on our friend, uh, our friends over at All Dolphins on their website because we were asked, here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a really, a really D-bag move. I'm going to quote myself briefly. <laughs> <laughs> on Xavier Howard specifically, because um, because Alan Pupar of, of all Dolphins had emailed a bunch of us on the SI Fan Nation Network. It's like, hey, what do you guys think about your team and Xavier mm-hmm. Howard? Here's what I wrote. <clears throat> Waking up with a third arm, seeing an elephant in my backyard, the Chiefs trading for Xavier Howard. These are the three things that would surprise me to equal degrees. 
Um, so that's the open of my paragraphs, but I would be stunned beyond words if the Chiefs traded for Xavier Howard. Absolutely floored. It's not a position that Brett Veach has ever shown any interest in putting significant resources into. Um, and to his and Steve Spagnuolo's shared credit, they've gotten really good performances out of guys at lower price tags. Um, Bashad Breeland still would have fit that bill for me, but whatever. <laughs> um, I would be, I'd be floored if they, if they made a move for Howard. I would probably be happy, honestly. Yeah. Um, and it, if, if Frank Clark got suspended, his contract would be movable. It still wouldn't be great, but it would be movable um, if his guarantees got voided, if he got suspended and everything. And I'm not sure any of that's a foregone conclusion, but also a story went up on, as, as we were recording this, I think a couple minutes before we started our, our conversation here, um, I was publishing a, a story from Connor Christofferson over at Arrowhead Report about exactly what Frank Clark's deal might look like if he does get suspended. Anyway, um, I, I don't think they're going to be in on that. And I really don't think they're probably going to be in on anybody yeah. um, because I think if they're looking for, I, I'll tell you what, it would make me more confused about Breland if they do end up even just signing a veteran um, after a training camp cut down because you had a guy that's been excellent on your team for the last couple of years, just bring him back and have him through the entire off season again. For sure. So I, I think they're just kind of betting on the guys they've got right now. Yeah. And, and that, that, that spooks me a little bit. Yeah, completely understand that. You know, I think that's going to be, um, I was asked a question and I think that's going to be my most, honestly, most, most watched going into training camp um, from a, just a position of seeing what evolves. I am kind of like, you know, I'm really excited about the DN spot, but I think from just kind of a dissecting and really seeing what happens is going to be that cornerback spot. Yeah. Um, I, I have so many other questions I want to ask you, man. I know you got a lot going on. So if you want to rapid fire me some real quick, I can give you those, I can give you those TV length answers if you'd like. All right. <clears throat> uh, do we add another spot at the running back position? No, I think it's, I think it's Clyde, Daryl and Jarek McKinnon, Darwin Thompson outside looking in. They okay. could have a role still. They carry four running backs. <laughs> okay. If you, uh, if you could pick any player on the chiefs right now, that's going to get cut. Uh, who are you going to say? Like a surprise cut. Uh, we'll go surprise cut and then just one that's just not going to make it. Um, I'm pulling up over the cap. I need to see. I'll tell you, uh, Andrew Wiley is my guy. I think maybe he gets traded. His contract is the most movable out of those right guards. I, I, and, I and he should be in a rotation somewhere. Uh, the Chiefs, I think, just added too many. So there's my guy. Okay. Anybody from the receiving spot that we might anticipate not making this squad? Um, I think it'll be the guys that are relatively far down the list. I, I think you're going to see a pretty chalk receiving core at this point of, you know, down to Byron Pringle. And then somewhere after that being the cutoff, I don't think we see any huge shocks with like Hardman or Robinson or anything. They need all those guys to perform. Number two tight end. I think it's probably Noah Gray. I think, I, I think, I think at least, at least in terms of pass catching um, you, you'll see Blake Bell back. I think it's Blake Bell and Noah Gray doing two different jobs, basically splitting that role. Hot or cold? Cold. I, I am miserable. My, my office is getting a little toasty just from having the door shut for 40 minutes or whatever. I hate it. <laughs> That's what's up. Joshua Briscoe. I appreciate you coming on my friend. Really? This was incredible. I do want to have you on again. Uh, it means a lot for you to give me the time. Um, you guys honestly listen to him on the radio. It's fantastic. Almost entirely sports uh, over at 810 and then catch everything. Uh, you know, always all of his writings before I let you go, let everybody know where they can find you one more time. The, the best question in the world uh, at JB Briscoe, anywhere you can find me, uh, any social media platforms, almost entirely sports as most weeknights on sports radio, 810. Uh, you can go to aes.show. That's a URL dot show is a, is a URL. Now you go to aes.show and you can uh, get the podcast. So it'll give you links to wherever you get your podcast or just search for almost entirely sports. And then arrowheadreport.com. You can follow me at JB Briscoe. You can follow at SI chiefs on Twitter as well. Um, the uh, the Arrowhead Report Twitter account. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll find everything else eventually. Uh, and then one more thing, you got to give Jordan Foote a hard time. I know uh, okay. I, heard, I heard him come on. Uh, he's deathly afraid of pigeons, which is crazy to me. Yes, uh, this came up on the show at one point. Yeah, crazy. I listened to it. Yeah, so uh, yeah, pretty crazy. But um, yeah, man, I appreciate you coming on. You guys know how I wrap this up. I appreciate you checking out The Beat of KC. And as always, have a good day.